Welcome to A Clinical Breath, respiratory insights from industry leaders. A Clinical Breath provides the community with the latest respiratory developments, trends, and expertise, all aimed at improving patient outcomes. Today's episode is brought to you by Monahan Medical Corporation. Monahan means it matters. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Opinions are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Monaghan Medical Corporation. Thank you for joining us for a Clinical Breath, Respiratory Care Insights from Industry Leaders. Joining me today is Dr. Michael Bowman. We're going to talk about sports participation for a patient with asthma. Great. Let's begin by having you tell us a little bit about what some of the limitations are for exercise in a patient with asthma in terms of the perceptions, the limitations, the induction of bronchospasm, you have it, you name it. It's a challenge that um, children with asthma face and their parents and school staff, coaches, everybody has difficulty really knowing what's going on because in a lot of children, Uh, exercise can be a major trigger for their uh, difficulty breathing. They get short of breath. They may not uh, wheeze, sometimes they do, but they may cough or they may just feel like there's an elephant sitting on their chest. And so uh, all they know is that it's not fun. And they don't realize that other classmates or cousins or siblings have a ball uh, playing hard and roughhousing and everything. They just know that they feel crummy when they do it. If they wheeze, that's much easier for parents and others to recognize. But if they don't, it's a real challenge to know what's going on. I see kids out at recess and sometimes people are hanging back. If they don't participate in recess, there are other reasons, but that might be one that they just don't want to start feeling bad. Right. Do you see that? Yes, very definitely. And uh, I think that when youngsters are considering uh, trying out for eight-year-old soccer or something, um, they may have no experience. They may have no friends on the team. They may be self-conscious or they may have asthma. There are lots of reasons for not doing it. Um, When you get to older youngsters, they may have obesity. And when you have obesity, it's hard to know whether asthma has made it so they can't exercise so the obesity gets worse, or does the obesity contribute to how bad the asthma is. And then you have the parents who obviously don't want to acknowledge that their child is limited, and they're pushing them, and they're trying to motivate them, but at the same time, the child is trying, but not being successful. Right. And one of the things that I always ask when I see a new patient is, how do they do with exercise? Oh, fine. Uh, What do they do? Well, she plays with dolls a lot, or he likes uh, uh, Nintendo. Um, And we find that the kids never do anything. Um, That way they don't have any symptoms, they don't feel bad, Mm -hmm. and the family doesn't realize there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so it's crucial to not only ask um, how do they do, but what do they do, so that they really get a a feel whether they're out there mixing it up and doing well, or never being active at all. And what are some of the ways that you can kind of identify the fact that because of their lack of motivation to exercise, they might very well have asthma that has not been properly diagnosed or managed. How do you go approach that subject because you're really kind of invading the personal space of the parent and the family? Right, and and we try to to sort out what other symptoms are there. How do they do with colds? Uh, Do their colds last two weeks rather than five days? Do they wheeze in any other settings? Uh, Have they ever needed prednisone? There are a variety of things that go along to complement The big picture is asthma, the exercise intolerance is down here, and they're related. But if you dig, you can find that uh, there are other other difficulties. They may wake up at night. Um, It has seemed to me that um, when youngsters or anybody wheezes with their asthma, they're much more likely to get diagnosed correctly and more quickly than if they cough. And I look at those symptoms as being basically interchangeable. But when, when folks uh, wheeze as their main symptom, people hear it, 
they think asthma, mm -hmm. and they are much more likely to go to the parent and say, your child has asthma, we need to do a trial of a, a rescue medicine, that sort of thing. That success of a trial, whether there's cough or wheeze, the success of that uh, uh, reliever trial makes a big difference in saying, yes, this is the diagnosis, this is what we need to do. And we need to set for the parent and the child what our expectations are. They need to be able to play hard every day. How do you approach, I know you talk to the parents, but sometimes the children, out of the mouths of children comes truth. Yes. How do you approach talking to the children and sometimes probably without the parent being present? Right. Most of the time, I think if it's a uh, early teenager or older, you can probably get by without uh, having the, the parent present. We use in clinic a um, uh, asthma control test that we give to the, the family in the five to 11 year olds. They have, the, the child has a part and the parent has some questions. Mm -hmm. And so we use one of the questions is exercise. And so the child will wind up saying good, bad, or indifferent. And very mm -hmm. often we'll have the parents say, I had no idea you couldn't run around the, the school. Well, you never asked me. And so that use is a way of finding out from the child mm -hmm. what's going on and then asking, um, what do you like to play? Uh, what do you like to watch? What's, what's your favorite sport? Who do you look after? Who's your hero mm -hmm. or heroine? In, uh, so these are questions that even with the parent, the child will be able to answer freely without any sure. intimidation. Right. Yeah. And, and sometimes parents are overprotective. Sometimes they're pushy. They will sometimes tell the, the school uh, personnel that uh, their child has asthma and uh, can't do PE. Other times they'll not say anything because one of the things that athletic trainers find is that parents may not admit that their child or their teen has asthma because they're afraid if they're known to have asthma, they're not going to get a fair shot at making I the see. team. Right. Mm -hmm. And so trying to get the parents comfortable with telling it as it is in the school setting is really important in, in both early, directions. In, in an earlier podcast, we talked about the challenge of getting school nurses to be more involved. How about athletic trainers? Now, moving into the teenage years where a lot more involvement, especially with organized sports, are the sports trainers and the coaches getting on board with this to your satisfaction? Um, one of my side projects right now is working on a project to rewrite the asthma-related expectations for athletic trainers. So hopefully in the next year, we will have a new set of updated uh, expectations of competency for athletic trainers. Uh, it's interesting that um, a fair number of teens in schools, the nurse's office may be a long way away from where they are, but they're on the field or in the locker room every day or several times a day. And so their key staff person that they relate to the most may well be the athletic trainer. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is that they, these trainers become as interested in asthma and its successful control as they are in uh, um, concussions and other things which are perhaps more popular about consequences of sports because uh, we expect folks to be able to, to participate at the highest level in spite of their asthma. Now let's talk a little bit about exercise-induced asthma. Uh, why don't you kind of clarify that for our audience because that gets tossed around an awful lot and yet at the same time it is quantifiable, I understand. Yes. Well, uh, exercise-induced bronchospasm is a term that was uh, prominent uh, in the late 1900s and it was viewed and, and shown to be related to cold, dry air. And I think of it as when uh, adults go skiing, or kids, uh, that they may wind up having major asthma attacks. There is also a situation where exercise is a trigger for garden variety asthma. And I think that is very common in kids and under-recognized because it's convenient for folks to say, oh, it's just EIB. When in fact, if you look carefully, there are a whole lot of other features of poorly controlled asthma mm -hmm. 
besides just the, the so exercise. So the asthma is there, it's just a trigger in this yes. case is, is the exercise. And, right, because one of the major treatments or preventives for EIB is warm up. That there are, mm. are very detailed uh, um, preparation uh, protocols for folks to uh, try to, to minimize their EIB flare with how they warm up prior to going up on the slope or whatever else they do. Mm -hmm. So there's warm up and then there's cool down after yes, the exercise. Exactly. And that winds up uh, uh, decreasing to a great degree the symptomatology or the severity of their asthma flare. What about the concern that parents have about the uh, illegal use of certain performance enhancing drugs? Now, albuterol taken pre-exercise, is that acceptable? Is that considered it's my to be? Un it's my understanding that that is, that is okay. But the, the general rule is the higher up and, and more official or competitive the, the sports teams are, AAU and that sort of thing, they are much more uh, precise in terms of what is acceptable. And so um, it's always important for parents and especially the, the athlete to know what they're taking and to be totally straightforward and make sure that they have the doctor's order for whatever it is that they're taking. I think you're suggesting that a legacy of track record of having used this long term is, is probably very, very helpful to justify its use going forward. Yes, I, th I think that, that being able to, to show that the uh, good control of, of asthma uh, is, is accomplished through routine management according to what the prescriber has said, mm -hmm. regardless of whether the prescriber is an allergist or a pulmonologist or a pediatrician or a family medicine person, if they've gotten it right and gotten to a, a regimen that works, uh, recognizing the need to, to see uh, exercise triggered flares, um, trying to, to do wind sprints on a really hot and humid day, mm -hmm. uh, that may still require albuterol rescue. Mm -hmm. um, they need to have it available. Sure. And at the same time, when we talk about the steroids, we mentioned before the inhaled steroids tend to be much, much less of an impact physiologically than yes. the, the Arnold Schwarzenegger right. ones, which are really the performance enhance enhancing ones. And people, uh, I think there's been enough communication between asthma experts and the sports community to recognize that this, these things are okay. They're not, mm -hmm. they are focused on the lungs and the airways rather than uh, trying to make muscles stronger or quicker. Uh, it's a, of great interest to a lot of youngsters. I always keep a list in my office of um, uh, athletes, top well-known athletes mm -hmm. who have asthma so that uh, our patients can say, oh, Jackie Joyner Kersey, uh, I like track. She was an Olympian. She won the Olympics. Mm -hmm. She has asthma. If you're a swimmer, Michael Phelps has asthma. Um, uh, David Beckham has asthma. Soc I mean, soccer, that's the one that most of the younger kids are right. starting to play anyway, exactly. much earlier, the five, six, seven year olds. Right. So. And, and that's why we actually have more issues, I think, for participation by our kids with asthma for soccer and basketball and probably tennis compared to baseball and softball and track. If they're trying to be a cross country person, obviously that's an mm -hmm. issue, but um, many of the other uh, settings are not just continual minute by minute by minute running, whereas soccer and uh, 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 basketball are. Mm -hmm. And so those are things where kids need to know, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really almost like uh, having a child recognize that they can do as much as they want to do as long as the asthma is properly controlled. And another, going back to what we said earlier, proper control is the key here right. for an ongoing social action, interactive life. Right. And, and some kids just don't really want to play hard. But if they are living in a den of athletes mm -hmm. uh, or their, their cousins or their, their best buds want to be out there playing, um, if they're not part of that, need to at least consider 
whether there are things going on to say asthma, asthma control could help. So the motivation is kind of multifaceted, it seems to be. It's it going is. to be family, it's going to be the individual, it's going to be the peer pressure, it's right. going to be the community. And it's going to be the school. And I think one of the things that I think is, is under-recognized is the importance of school personnel being able to communicate with the prescriber. Um, we've tried to get, uh, it's still an ongoing challenge, to get the um, health plans, Medicaid plans and insurance plans, to include school personnel on their acceptable team because generally it includes the family, the prescriber, and the health team. Mm -hmm. And the school nurse or coaches are not in there at all. And so when the folks Child at school- Child is spending 50, 60% of their time in that environment. Exactly. And exercise may be the, the toughest environmental exposure, so to speak, that the child endures. And it's the, the kids or the, the adults at school who see that. Mm -hmm. And so trying to make it that they can feel comfortable communicating uh, to the parent and to the prescriber what's going on or to the case manager for the insurance company. That can be a way of getting it to work in terms of recognizing where there's a problem. I think we probably would need a really committed physician such as yourself talking to that case manager at the health plan. They're also known as the gatekeepers. Yes. But it seems to me you're bringing out a much broader aspect than just the dollars and cents for the medications. You're talking about a much greater impact on that health plan and also on the family and the patient, and in this case, the child. Yes, very definitely. And, and we wind up putting it um, uh, in terms of things that the health plan can uh, recognize or pay attention to. I point out that um, one trip from school to the ER by paramedics uh, will buy 40 spacers. Right. And a night in the ER will buy 60 spacers. Mm -hmm. And so if the health plan says you can only have one spacer once a year, that is stupid. And so uh, trying to recognize that good care uh, that keeps the child well or, or less symptomatic, mm -hmm. more normal, um, will wind up saving money in terms of the overall cost because you're markedly decreasing sure. the visits to the ER and those sorts of things. And that says nothing about attendance at school, uh, general feeling of I can do this, self-confidence, sure, sure. all of those things. You know, I used to help hear people say the most expensive ride to the emergency room is the 911, the paramedics, and the most expensive door into the hospital is the yes. emergency room door. Yes. So exactly. we want to avoid both of those, and it is possible to do. It is, very definitely. But I think having more communication and appreciation for what the, the teachers, the nurses, the coaches, and the athletic trainers mm -hmm. can see at school that needs to be included in the overall assessment of how the youngster is doing. And folks or school nurses tell me they have problems getting asthma action plans from the pediatricians to them in school and that they wind up having some difficulty getting uh, approval to do an adequate control of a flare-up of symptoms, whether it's exercise triggered or whatever. And so that's another area where we need to have the medicines and the, the instructions for them uh, with the school nurse, the after school, the athletic folks, the field trip people, as well as the grandparents who do daycare after school and that sort of thing. Well, Dr. Bowman, I think hopefully this view, viewers will recognize what you said. And thanks again for sharing your insights with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. You've been watching A Clinical Breath, respiratory insights from industry leaders. Brought to you by the Monaghan Medical Corporation. Monaghan means it matters. Thank you for watching and tune in again for more respiratory-related topics.